Hello, I'm High Hill Knight. Welcome to my channel. These are my thoughts on the 2018 edition of WWE Survivor Series. Before I get into the show itself, uh, I guess I gotta mention this. During the program, there was a big old ruckus in the crowd, and I figured it was just some, you know, fans being obnoxious. That happens every once in a while in the show. But I just found out as I was making my recording of about the program that the person making the ruckus was Enzo Amore. Apparently, uh, he attended the show. He uh, wore a custom T-shirt stylized in one of his old WWE T-shirts and was just running around, you know, being a fool as he often does. And uh, eventually, security uh, acquired him, you know, tackled him down, uh, took him to the back, and I guess after some holding, you know, kicked him out of the uh, arena entirely. So, yeah, normally I want to talk about some nonsense that happens in the crowd, but, yeah, it's, it was in Amore, so I got to stick it in here somewhere. So that's why I'm getting to this right here, right now. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled essay about WWE Survivor Series 2018. Now, Survivor Series used to be my second favorite of the big four pay-per-views from the WWE. The big four, of course, being... Warrior Rumble, WrestleMania, my favorite, but, you know, <laughs> WrestleMania is supposed to be the favorite, uh, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. And I always loved Survivor Series because the uh, traditional multi-person uh, tag team elimination match, because you usually have these small squads of uh, very oddly assembled groups uh, uh, with some oddly uh, theme. I remember uh, one time, uh, you know, Jerry Lawler was fighting Doings, so he had multiple Doings versus, uh, uh, you know, J Jerry Lawler's team. And then another time, uh, I think it was like a Money Inc. had a tag team with some other guys. They really looked up the Ultimate Money guys or Tax Collector or something like that. Shawn Michaels, I think, led a team against... Jerry Lawler also, or something about the Kings Court, or, or replace him, whatever the case, there was always some type of little theme to go along with the mishmash of all the athletes in the uh, program, and throughout the program, you usually saw just about everyone that was on the active roster. Nowadays, you do sort of see almost everyone on the active roster, but it's more about, okay, we got to fill some spaces who's on the roster, as opposed to really building up a, a story and theme behind these mashups. I mean, yes, there are individual storylines here and there, but really a, a theme of this team other than, well, we're on Raw, so who's on Raw that we can use to fill these bodies? Oh, who's on SmackDown so we can fill these bodies? Okay, which is why uh, I'm uh, the title of this essay, And So You're Back from Out of Space, from the classic of uh, Glory Gaynor song, I Will Survive. Uh, for instance, the tag team uh, elimination match, which counts yet doesn't count because through the main show, you know, they said Raw was a clean sweep, but at the same time, Corey Grace had to keep reminding and reminding and reminding that the SmackDown won the tag team <laughs> elimination battle royal. Plus, uh, the main show had six events, so what, theoretically, if we went three to three, would the tag team match have been the tiebreaker? You know, it's not explained at all. So, so yeah. Well, anyway, the Usos wound up winning, which is cool because I love seeing the Usos and I love seeing the New Day work. But there are so many people in that team that I either forget about or uh, remember but overlook. For instance, uh, the B team, you know, who had a really fun push earlier this year. You know, I forgot about those. I was trying to remember, okay, who's on the tag teams? Who's on these tag teams? You know, or uh, the Ascension, who seem to be getting taken seriously these past couple of months, and now they're sort of like falling back to that, uh, you know, glorified job or status. And then the colognes, I can't tell you how many times I've said, oh, the colognes, they still work here? In the past two years, okay? <laughs> they come and go, come and go without serious life. Really great match, uh, and it's wonderful that the Revival, again, another team that's sort of been uh, tossed to the wayside, uh, got to be up on the, the final team to really have a good moment uh, in the spotlight. But yeah, <laughs> that's a classic example of, uh, and so you're back from out of six because <laughs> who's, who's, who do we have to fill to fit one of these 10 team uh, tag team match? What teams do we have? And if not, we'll just grab somebody, I don't know, I guess from NXT or something. Which leads me to the women's match. That was women's uh, elimination. I'm always looking forward to whatever women's event is going to be on the card. And this 
uh, was good overall. But think about the build to this. I mean, you had Sasha Banks and Bailey coming in to replace Natty and uh, Ruby Riot. And there's so many things about this that's just stupid. For instance, you know, uh, Alexa Bliss had <laughs> Bailey and Sasha fight just to have them ambushed and not be put on the team. And then she puts Riot on the team, <laughs> even though she knows that Riot just did this uh, ultimate disrespect to Natty. And then when Natty and uh, Ruby start clashing, she, you know, there's two spots open. So why don't you just put in the other two members of the Riot squad and keep out uh, Ruby Riot and Natasha Benoit. We bring in Bailey uh, and uh, Sasha anyway, all for the ultimate spot where uh, Nia Jax betrays um, Sasha and you know, winds up getting the win for herself and uh, Nia Jax becomes the sole survivor. You know, this is just giant Rube Goldberg method to get heat onto Nia Jax. It's just so absurd. Now, granted, the crowd, oh man, the crowd absolutely hated Nia Jax and she uh, just lived it up, really worked the crowd well, really like took in all those boos and all that anguish. Uh, she didn't use the, the face breaker punch. I don't know if I order or just uh, saved up for maybe on Raw or later down the line. But yeah, it, it was a very exciting uh, women's match and Mandy Rose, oh yeah, another one of those. Oh, well, we need to fill a spot. Well, who else on SmackDown is there to wrestle? Oh, Mandy Rose. Big surprise, you know. <laughs> so, Mandy Rose did really well. So it was great to see that uh, her have a moment of shining in a crew. But still, it's like, yeah, you know, it's just the roster of women versus the roster of women, as opposed to like a you know really uniquely assembled team versus a really uniquely assembled team. That just frustrates me coming from uh, the classic style of Survivor Series. Next was Seth Rollins versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Nice match. Uh, I was very surprised that Dean Ambrose didn't get involved in any shape, form, or fashion. I figured he was going to do some type of run-in or some distraction from the crowd. But no, Dean Ambrose wasn't on the program at all. I figured, figured uh, when Seth Rollins was having his uh, post-match interview that also the team was going to come in and jump from behind. That didn't happen. So, okay, great. Uh, nice, clean match. That was a nice surprise. So, cool. Now we have the bar versus the AOP. And first, let me say, I hate that I have to call the authors of pain now AOP. I don't know if this is just this hashtag generation where everything has to be condensed down in order to, uh, you know, fit uh, Twitter space, all that kind of stuff. I mean, Sheamus was originally Sheamus O'Shaughnessy. You know, uh, Cesaro, you originally get Tammy with Cesaro. Even Naomi, you know, she was originally Naomi Knight, but then she was in with the, the Divas time period, so maybe they cut off her name, so it just be one name. You know, I, 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 it, it, Triple H was fine because... You know, Hunter Hearst Hemsley is a lot of is a lot to say. So you know, making it Triple H is fine, but he was still people still refer to him as Hunter every once in a while, or Mr. Helmsy as once in a while. You know, whereas I'm getting the feeling that the AOP is just going to be called the AOP. I don't think anyone's going to ever say Authors of Pain again, which is a really cool name. But anyway, we had this match, and again, the AOP is just got these tag team titles, and it's hard to take. It's seriously when you got uh, a one-time uh, tag team champions versus five-time tag team champions, a, a tag team uh, that you know broke the New Day's uh, uh, long-term like record of uh, having the tag titles. You know, a team that's been on champions on both brands, and they got the big show. But I swear, I am. I truly believe that this was all made so that Vince McMahon can have a situation where uh, the Big Show and um, Drake Maverick were <laughs> involved with each other because you know any opportunity he has to have like a big man versus a little man, uh, he'll take that situation. And granted, I didn't expect some type of you know urination thing, and I don't think the urination worked as well as it was supposed to. Usually, if you want to do a urination joke, it's you know pretty fluid within and big stain. They're just a twinkle stain. So I guess maybe something wrong with general advice. But anyway, what does this do? What does this do? I mean, Cesaro and Sheamus, okay, they already lost their tag team titles of Raw to Braun Strowman and a child earlier this year. And now they're losing because of a urination situation. And what does this do for the AOP? Yeah, they won. 
but now their manager is going to be known as the PP guy. And plus, Drake Maverick is going to be an authority figure still on 205 Live. So is this going to affect him on 205 Live at all? You know, it's just a really ridiculous situation just to get a PP joke and a big guy and a little guy uh, joke into there. But hey, it's still McMahon's company. So, you know, I, I hope he's happy because I'm not. It, it, it was, that, that match was practically a waste of time for everyone involved. But, hey, uh, AOP won. Whoop-dee-doo. All right, next, Buddy Murphy versus uh, Mustafa Ali. A uh, very exciting match, as I expected. Um, it was pretty cool. Buddy Murphy won. But uh, Ali took one of the most dangerous bumps I have ever seen. He was pushed off from the top turnbuckles backwards and landed uh, thankfully, is back to the uh, audience barricade, but just a few inches to the wrong spot or too far back or too far forward, he would have landed with the back of his head on like the edge of the rail, or you know, you know, it, it would have it could have been disastrous. And here's the thing about injuries with when it comes to wrestling, you know, injuries happen, but so many times the injuries are based on basic things. I'm like even earlier tonight in the tag team match, apparently uh, Kalisto got injured. And at first, I was thinking it was just a work because you could hear uh, like Xavier Woods and other people saying like, "Sweep the legs, sweep the legs." So I figured that was that was meant to happen. But he was exchanged for another member of Lucha House Party. So unceremoniously, I get the feeling that he really was uh, injured or, or tweaked his leg or something like that. And he didn't do anything dangerous. He just like landed on a flip or something. Or like Seth Rollins when he did this little uh, flip that, that he's done dozens of times in matches and he hurt his knee. Or Triple H earlier this year, you know, he ripped his. Uh, bicep muscle doing like you know irish and things like of course he's you know he's old but still it's like you know he hurt himself that way or sid vicious just jumping down from the from uh top rope not even like a super elite view, just coming down shattering his lower leg you know so lots of time it's the simple moves that wind up on hey even nia jack's throwing a punch too hard you know winds up giving uh you know becky lynch a concussion right and you know, damaging her nose. So yeah, so to purposely do a dangerous spot where she, does, where Ali just falls back, and no one's there to catch him, no one's there to to make sure that he's you no know, he's okay, no one makes sure that he lands in the right spot. He and he's looking, and there's no way he can see behind himself to make sure that he's coming in the right way. It's just a completely blank, you know, blind fall to the back. Really dangerous. I hope he never ever does something like that again. I hope no one in the WWE does like that. Okay, the day before, Ricochet did this crazy super flip off the top of a cage, which was dangerous enough. At least there were some men <laughs> in the ring to help break his fall. Or, you know, but no, that with Ali going back, no, please, please, please never ever do something like that again. And no one in the WWE ever do a dangerous stuff like that. There's plenty of other dangerous moves to do without something that blindfully dangerous so please never ever do something like that again so now it's time for the men's elimination uh tag team match and if you've been keeping track uh it's now three for raw zero for smackdown because we're not counting the tag team tag, tag team match from uh, the kickoff show at least not yet and uh once again raw wins okay fine uh but once again braun Strowman is attacked or screwed over by his own team members. If you recall the previous year, uh, it was Strowman and Triple H. And now we got Strowman and uh, Baron Corbin with the dash of uh, Drew McIntyre in there as well. Bobby Lashley, uh, apparently his job is just to uh, stand still and look pretty. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, I was not looking forward to this match at all. I mean, you got no one on the SmackDown team that can legitimately pose a threat to both Braun Strowman and Bobby Lashley, other than Samoa Joe, and he got taken out like that. So right there, you know, like I'm already barely looking forward to this match, and now you take out the one element that could possibly stand up to the most powerful guns of the other team. I'm like, Pfft. and there is that spot when the Raw team started fighting each other, and for some reason the SmackDown team joined into the melee. Now yes, it led to Braun Strowman getting uh that uh elbow drop in tables uh, splash, you know, from the outside. But still, if you see your opposing team fighting, beating up themselves, imploding, you don't join the fight. You let them fight, okay? You let them beat themselves up. 
and then once they're down, then you pick the bones. That was just so stupid. You know, again, another one of those Rube Goldberg, uh, you know, setups just to get Braun Strowman uh, down for the, for, the, for the majority of the match and things like that. So, yeah. So, anyway, it winds up being, you know, Shaman Man all by himself taking the final blunts of, of, from uh, Braun Strowman. It raw wins. You got Strowman and Lashley and McIntyre as the winners, not the sole survivors, as the uh, ring announcer said. <laughs> no, soul means one, darling, okay? <laughs> but yeah, so now it's 4 0 to SmackDown, even, but the commentators are still saying, well, maybe SmackDown can pull it together. Like, no, it, it, it's 4 to 0. Uh, there's no, they've lost. In fact, they don't even show the ticket counter on the screen after that point. Of, after the uh, um, uh, Cesaro and Mustafa Ali match, they show 3 to 0. At that point, they don't show the scoreboard again until the very end of the night. Once all the matches are done, and they show, oh yeah, six to zero <laughs> in a raw. It's like, oh, well, SmackDown, maybe they can still do, do something. Like, no, it, it's four matches. It, it's four to whatever is left. It, there's not going to be more. There's not going to be five more events. <laughs> and in fact, uh, I'm skipping over uh, Charlotte Flair and um, Rousey just for a moment because that was my favorite match of the night. So I'm going to skip over that so I can talk about last and talk about uh, Lesnar versus. Uh, Daniel Bryan. Thank goodness the latter half of that match was so much better. Um, and did you notice that, you know, uh, Brock Lesnar, he came out into his usual gear, didn't wear any type of raw, even the Paul Heyman did any type of uh, raw colors. And Daniel Bryan, he didn't come out in any kind of SmackDown colors, you know, no, no blue uh, outfit, no blue shirt, just came out with a regular shirt. It's like, yeah, we know. SmackDown Law, so you know, just have them be, be in their own, own ear. Like, okay, you know, like, hey, you put on this concept of head-to-head -head one time of the year, one time of the year, they go head-to-head, -head, and you should have them wearing the colors, you know. I, if You're paying Brock Lesnar millions and millions of dollars just to show up and go like this. You know, it costs several, <laughs> you know. If you can, if you can, uh, uh, get him to, to pay him that to just bounce around every once in a while. You can get him into a, a freaking raw shirt. But anyway, uh, you know, the, the latter half of the match was wonderful, but it should have happened much sooner. <laughs> they dragged out that whole uh, Suplex City, um, you know, Lesnar dominance of, of um, Daniel Bryan way too long, especially since, you know, there's a point where he covered it and pulled him off. You know, at the towards the end of the match, it makes it seem like okay, well, this is Daniel Bryan's game plan to you know bring Lesnar to a false sense of security. But it's like, yeah, but you still laid out for a pinfall. You know, you you can't predict that he's going to pick you up. You know, and so it's just ridiculous that uh, you know Daniel Bryan seemed to have had this uh, miraculous second win and, and and do all this after the fact. Actually, he's been tossed around. Uh, pillar to post, literally, you know, pillar to post. Uh, yeah, it should have happened much for It put probably have at least two minutes here because I and the crowd, we were just not into it. They were saying, you know, same old S word, same old S word. And I was feeling the same way. Like, look, man, look, it's it's freaking, you know, past 10 o'clock. Okay, you know, let's, you know, let's get this match over with. Okay. I was barely looking forward to AJ Styles versus. Uh, Buck Nestler, but at least there were some build twists as they fought each other the, the previous year. You know, at least there was some type of anticipation, but then we just tossed it day by last minute, and he's now this uh, heel persona that I guess is not going to talk when he speaks, uh, when he's asked questions for interviews. You know, we don't really know what kind of, uh, you know, heel he's going to be versus Lesnar, who's just practically phoning it in at this point. I mean, you know, so yeah, it, it was the latter half was great. The first half was just annoying. I mean, they even walked around the ring twice. Bless walked around the ring twice. I was like, just get this over. Come on, it's, probably, it's past ten o'clock, man. We, we people got places to go. All right. So the finally, well, not finally, but before finally, we had Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair. The match that I was looking forward to the most. Well, the match I was looking forward to the most was Becky Lynch. Versus Ronda Rousey, but we all know what happened. So you know uh, they fixed things as best they could, and now we have Charlotte Flair versus Ronda Rousey. 
and it was going really well and exciting. It was sloppy in a good way with various counters. No uh, woman getting uh, an advantage over the other one for far, for too long. Uh, getting out of arm bars, getting out of uh, leg uh, traps and things like that. It was very uh, exciting. And I was wondering how this is going to go because it's pretty clear that, okay, I guess Raw is going to have a clean sweep or maybe, uh, just maybe this would be the one match that 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 that, that doesn't tick on the SmackDown uh, end, but then again, uh, they clearly don't want Rousey to lose anytime soon, if ever. So I was really like puzzled how this is going to end. What, you know, maybe a double counter or something like that. I don't know, but still, uh, the Kendo stick. Wow, what a surprise! Uh, not only does uh, Charlotte Flair go full heel, but she just unloads on Rousey with the Kendo stick with and with the. Uh, you know, the chair uh, moment at the end. And that was really surprising considering how we got here was a simple punch, you know, a, a punch to, to by Nia Jax to uh, Becky, you know, wind up causing this whole change in, in, in the match. And early in the year, you know, we got um, Alexa Bliss having a concussion. We got, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Triple H getting injured. We got, uh, you know... Um, one of the Lucha House Party is even getting injured. You got Kevin Owens, who, who, who had to take down for, for a while. You know, it's like, you got, and even uh, on that big night on Raw when the females of the SmackDown attacked the Raw women, you can see Becky Lynch uh, making sure to hit uh, Ronda Rossi just right in the right spot and not too hard to protect the main event. So to just see Rousey just get absolutely obliterated with the kendo set. I have not, I don't recall seeing a women's match in the WWE where they were just allowed to just unload with kendo sets and various things. They've got some very uh, extreme matches and, 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 and tough matches, but just viciously unloading and unloading and unloading with kendo sticks and just, uh, you know, there were whelps all over Rousey's body and Rousey was just absolutely obliterated and the crowd loved it. The crowd was like, thank you, Charlotte. The crowd was clearly behind Charlotte because it's, it's more of a case of just frustrating about the overprotection of Ronda Rousey at this point. But yeah, that was just right. Not just that uh, Charlotte uh, attacked with the foreign object because, you know, she's still overall a heel in my book. She's still the daughter of the dirtiest player in the game. But still, just that absolute, total viciousness. Just wonderful. Loved it. I really look forward to seeing where this goes with Rousey, with Charlotte, and eventually with Becky when she comes back in. So, yeah, great way to uh, almost end the night. And that's probably why the Lesnar and uh, Bryan situation was so frustrating. Because after all that excitement and craziness and surprise, we got to like, wait like eight minutes for, for uh, Lesnar and uh, Bryan to get some type of cup cup competition going on after you know all their ragdoll nonsense. So anyway, like the show overall, wonderful. But you know, next year hopefully we could actually build some real stories and real anticipation, and not be a case of all right, who's on the roster? We gotta fill five spots. Okay, and you, you you okay? Well, that's all we got left. Wonderful, and you know, <laughs> let's not have any more of that uh, going forward. Okay, those are my thoughts on WWE Survivor Series 2018. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to share whatever comments you like in the comment section. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, or dislike, share, and subscribe. Once again, I'm High Heel Knight, and remember, find inspiration everywhere.